Okay, Matt, we are streaming. So let's just give a couple more minutes for uh, further attendees and participants to make their way in. Sure. Matt, is it usually a crew view out on the river? Is it a couple other scientists or? Oh yeah, there's a, it's, it's kind of a, it's big science. And so there's a lot of folks um, involved um, both at NAU and with the USGS. Oh, okay. Yeah. So how, how big would you say like your trip on the 28th, how big is that group gonna be? Uh, we've got uh, 21 people. That's a pretty good group. Yeah. Yeah, it's a great, we got a great crew going. And do you guys um, have a lot of autonomy? Do you use a guide? Well, most of us have been doing it for so long that we kind of guide ourselves. Okay. <laughs> um, we're um, going to the same monitoring sites and um, a lot of us have been uh, worked as river guides down there and um, but we do take some uh, professional guides. This this trip coming up has eight boats. It's a rowing trip. Okay. Um, so I think we have uh, three uh, professional river guides with us. The rest are um, scientist boatmen. Interesting. So you, when you say it's a rowing trip, so you will be actually rowing, manually rowing the way down? Yeah, it's non-motor season in Grand Canyon National Park right now. So um, unless unless you have a, a need, you go through a process of determining whether you can um, do the work without motorboats. And then for this trip coming up, we can. And so we go um, or powered the, the channel mapping trips. Most of the stuff that I'm going to be talking about today um, requires motors because um, we have to go back and forth yeah. upstream and downstream. So, um, and we usually do those in the spring during non-motor season. So we kind of schedule it um, to um, uh, conform with, comply with uh, park service regulations. Yeah. They're a big partner in the program. Do they, is the no motor season, does it extend all the way through winter as well, or is it just spring and fall? Yeah, I believe it starts in uh, mid-September to maybe mid-April. I don't, I'm not exactly sure on the, the dates, but okay. something like that. Interesting. Well, at least you guys have everything figured out. How many more trips out there for the rest of the year do you have? Just a couple, or is it? Uh, just just this one, and then there um, there may be another. I'm not exactly sure. There's there um, there could be a, another um, experimental high flow, um, but that is being determined at as we speak. Okay. And so, if they do um, have a experimental high flow, I believe we may be going back out. But I. Um, those plans are kind of up in the air, sort of a, a fire drill when they determine whether they're gonna release a high flow or not, then we kind of scramble and um, <laughs> figure out who, how much money there is to um, fund the plans that are out there and then we go from there. Yeah. Okay, um, I'm gonna go ahead and get us rolling here. We've got yeah. a pretty good chunk of participants here. So I have a little bit of housekeeping for all attendees that have come in and have heard us talking here. Um, thanks for attending this after school talk. My name is Joe Wagner. I'm the Flagstaff Festival of Science Treasurer. Joining me is another board member, Dave Gillette, who's online and will be monitoring our chat and Q&A. And then also here we have Matthew Kaplinski, who's here to present on this evening's topic. Prior to getting started, I would like you to know that the festival is live streaming this webinar to YouTube, but only the hosts and panelists will be visible or heard during the simulcast. This event is a part of the Flagstaff Festival of Science, which we call the 10 best days of the year. Our mission is to connect and inspire the citizens of Northern Arizona, particularly youth, and the wonders of science and the joy of scientific discovery. Your participation and support are vital to our shared success. 
Uh, of course, all festival events are free thanks to our generous sponsors and our donors. And if you would like to support our work, please go to SciFest.org and click donate. This is uh, only one out of nearly 100 events during the festival this year. You can find a full list at SciFest.org. Some events pre-order tickets uh, and all of our webinars are offered the ability to pre-register for admission. The festival's Eventbrite page, flatflgscifest.eventbrite.com, which is also linked on our normal scifest.org website, has all the webinar registration links and many of the tickets for events that require a reservation. On the festival's webpage, in addition to finding a listing of all events, there is a link to the festival's YouTube page where you can find recorded versions of all the webinars and talks from this year's festival and previous festivals. Links to the festival's website and Eventbrite page can be found in the chat. We will put them up towards the end. Three upcoming events that I'm personally excited about include the Archaeology of Dogs in the Southwest. That's here in a few days. We'll be doing an expose on searching for life in outer solar system rivers and lakes. And of course, next Saturday, we're doing a repeat of the Tag a Monarch Butterfly event, which we did this past Saturday. If you missed part of this stream or any other festival events like the keynote that was Friday night, you can go to the Flagstaff Festival of Science YouTube page to watch and replay it. I did that earlier today. Even. One way to support the festival is to take a short five minute survey after the completion of this webinar and any other events you participate in. The data are very helpful for the board to improve as well as a great source of date data for uh, grant applications. The survey can be found on our website and also one of our survey respondents this year will be uh, drawn to win a pair of Apple AirPods after the completion of the festival. So please attendees uh, participate in our survey. During this presentation, please type your questions into the Q&A box. If you see a question that you like, please upvote it. Due to possible time constraints, we might prioritize the questions that have upvotes, so keep that in mind. If you have technical problems with the webinar, please communicate to us in the chat not the Q&A box. Okay, thank you for patiently waiting through the housekeeping portion of our event. You're probably fairly excited like I am, so I will turn it over to Matt Kaplinski in a moment to talk about surveying the Colorado River corridor in the Grand Canyon. Matt Kaplinski is a senior research scientist in the geology program, School of Earth and Sustainability here at Northern Arizona University. He has a bachelor's degree in geophysics from Western Michigan University and a master's degree in geology from Northern Arizona University. Matt has been learning about the Colorado River in Grand Canyon for the past 30 years as both a researcher and as a professional river guide. His main focus is investigating the effects of Glen Canyon Dam on the geomorphology and ecology of the river using topographic and bathymetric survey techniques. So without further ado, Matt, go ahead and take it away. Okay, thanks, Joe, and thanks everybody for sharing a bit of your afternoon with me. Uh, so today I wanna to talk to you about um, some of the work uh, that's going on down in the Grand Canyon. Um, and I wanted to start by saying that I am one of probably hundreds of people that are working down there. This is, uh, it's, big, it's a big science project and it, it has a lot of a lot of parts to it and a lot of uh, good folks doing good work down there. Um, in particular, uh, at the USGS, um, there's a number of people, Paul Grams, Keith Cole, Tom Gushu, Jill Sankey, Lord, um, I'm not gonna name all of these, but um, we are working in partnership with the USGS Grand Canyon Monitoring and Research Center um, and the National Park Service. I've got to get a Park Service logo to put on here because they are um, all the work occurs within Grand Canyon National Park, and um, um, they are certainly uh, worthy of a shout out here. Uh, my colleagues at NAU, Joe Hazel in particular, and many others, and also um, a lot of this work wouldn't be possible without the boatmen down there. Um, uh, Brian Durker in particular is uh, been instrumental in adapting the um, the the boats and the techniques that we use down there um, to run safely through the Grand Canyon on river trips and get it, getting all the work done at the same time. Uh, so with that, I'll move on. 
I'll move on. Uh, okay. My page is not turning. You could try exiting PowerPoint and then reinitiating, Matt. Boy, now everything's. I, I might have to reboot here. Sorry, Joe. Nothing's. That's okay. We're online. The attendees are here. <laughs> you can exit and come back in. It's a high. Oh, there we go. Okay. There it goes. Yep. Here we, let's try that again. There we are. Um, I also wanted to give a plug for the, uh, the website, the GCMRC website at, uh, housed it here in Flagstaff up on the hill there at the Southwest Biological Center. Um, the link is gcmrc.gov. A lot of the information that we're going to uh, be talking about today is available online through their website. So um, if you want to um, explore um, the, their website, there's a lot of good info there. Um, and um, so with all the plugs, let's get on to the talk. Um, I wanted to start by um, showing you, this is the discharge hydrograph. Um, on the y-axis over here is, oh, I didn't label it, um, is the discharge at least ferry from uh, in cubic feet per second with time here from 1920 up to about 2020 to show the pre-dam era. You can see the spring snowmelt floods here. And this is uh, at this point, 1963 is when the Glen Canyon Dam was, the, the gates were closed on Glen Canyon Dam. And you can see the the drastic change in the flow that is released from the dam downstream as compared to the pre-dam era. In the post-dam era, there's, you, can, you can split the uh, post-dam era into two, um, two eras. Um, first being unrestricted dam operations that um, elicited calls and um, concern from um, boatmen and environmental groups about the effects of um, particularly um, these daily fluctuations um, that led to um, the Grand Canyon Protection Act and an EIS. And it's changed, you can see it in the hydrograph in this, this era starting in about 1990, the flows, the amount of fluctuations per day were limited. And um, we're gonna be talking about surveys. Um, the title is Modern Surveys. Those all occur within this green environmental management restricted dam operation period. Um, if, we, if we zoom into this area in the next, um, next slide, I labeled this one here, discharge again in cubic feet per second. Um, from 1980 to almost to 2020, um, I wanted to highlight um, a few area, er, a few um, administrative milestones that happened during this environmental period of environmental management. In 1989, the Glen Canyon Dam environmental impact statement was started. Um, at the time, um, it was it was prepared. Um, and finalized in 1996. It was one of the largest EISs um, in history. During the preparation of the EIS in 1992, Congress passed the Grand Canyon Protection Act um, that established a long-term monitoring program that was formed at the USGS in 1996. Um, previous to that, the Bureau of Reclamation was running Glen Canyon Environmental Studies. Um, and in 1996, it established an adaptive management program um, and the USGS Grand Canyon Monitoring and Research Center was started. Um, and the Grand Canyon Monitoring Research Center is the science branch of the adaptive management program. The adaptive management program is a stakeholder group that makes recommendations on uh, changes in operations, um, in uh, it with the dam and um, they have some other uh, things they can do. Um, 
And um, the other thing I wanted to highlight is that through this program um, in 2012, the high flow experiment protocol was established that um, establishes the, this protocol of releasing high flows from the dam to mimic pre-dam flooding and um, cause disturbance events down there to rebuild eroded sandbars. Um, high flow experiments or control floods have been released um, in, from 96, 2004, 2008. And then you can see when that high flow protocol got an established, flows were released whenever um, there was enough sediment in the system to support a high flow release. We haven't had enough um, sediment input to the system, mainly from the Perea River since 2018. We currently have, um, we've had some big floods on the Perea this year, and we have enough um, sediment to trigger a high flow and talks are ongoing right now about um, whether or not that's gonna happen. Um, Today, I wanted to focus in on two mapping efforts in Grand Canyon. Um, the first I'll talk about is the aerial photography that's happened in um, 2002, 2009, and 2013. And this past spring, there was another flight in uh, 2021. So there should be another red dot out here. Um, we don't have the results from that, but it, um, it, uh, it happened. Um, they took pictures of the entire corridor and we'll talk more about that in a bit. And also the uh, channel mapping efforts that we um, were started um, in, in 2009 through 2019. We've got another trip this spring that we're planning. Um, so before I get into any of those, I wanna talk about the spatial reference network that's down, that's along the, the rims and along the river. And this is um, a series of benchmarks that all of these, this modern mapping uses to support um, and keep everything on a common, um, a common network, if you will. Um, so if we, this is a map of the Grand Canyon showing all the benchmarks, um, the, these are little green dots. There's so many that they're all sort of coalesced over here. So I zoomed in on around Point Hansboro and all of the benchmarks along the river corridor are denoted by these little yellow triangles. There's one up on the rim right at uh, Eminence Break. And if the next slide zooms in on this area in this box and it shows, um, this is a aerial photography from 2009 and the, the benchmarks that provide a common datum for mapping and monitoring projects um, are established using um, global nav navigation satellite systems, GPS, GLONASS, there's several other um, satellites up there from different countries and total station measurements. The accuracy on most of these stations is, is about a centimeter to um, vertically, it's a little, um, over a centimeter. So we have these um, benchmarks that we establish along the river so that all of these survey projects have are, are on the same network. They're on the same datum. And it's particularly important in change mapping when you when you when you look at change between measurements, you really want to make sure you're on the same network. Um, the benchmarks, what the, they look like, they're either, um, some are uh, scribed X's on rocks. There's historic benchmarks down there. This is a rusted bolt. Um, this is one of the, the newer ones, which is a brass pin that's set in a hole. Um, and these are what we use to establish our survey instruments on, and we survey off of these benchmark locations. Some benchmarks are better than others. Here's our, here's our friend Brian Cooper Ryder um, on a really bad one down, uh, down by Spring Canyon about 
204 miles downstream from Lee's Ferry. So onto the aerial photography. Aerial photography missions have been flown in 2002, 2009, 2013. And uh, I just mentioned that we flew one this spring. This happens over the Memorial Day weekend. Um, and this, these aerial photography missions are the only way that the program has to get a complete system-wide picture of the river corridor. Um, these, this is a picture of the collection corridor outlined in yellow here. The, the aerial photography concentrates on the river and um, you know about 300, 400 meters up uh, on the surrounding river terrain. Um, each segment, it's a, it's a big operation. It takes um, probably a week and each segment they fly um, four to six parallel flight lines that overlap over about 50%. This uh, zoom in of the map here shows the flight lines over the little Colorado River and this is the main stem river. Um, these, the overflights occur over the Memorial Day weekend and the flows from the dam um, are released at a steady 8,000 cubic feet per second so that we have a constant water level in all of the photography. Um, that's what this, this is a graph of discharge over, um, over about a week's time showing the window for, um, for collection. The, the flight lines are also restricted to certain times of the day to minimize um, shadows in the pictures. So a lot of effort goes into make, sh making sure that these photos are as good as they can be. Another aspect of the aerial photography is ground support. These are um, in red here. Well, here's the river corridor. In red here are benchmarks up on the rim that are occupied by GPS receivers, GNSS receivers collecting one second data. And these are used to post-process the onboard um, instruments of the plane to make sure that we have the best um, uh, positions on the plane and the best um, roll pitch motion data of that ship as it's collecting these things. Um, another thing that we do is on river trips before and right after the trip is we set out ground control panels throughout the corridor. There's 100 to 200, um, depending on the flight mission, I think we put out about 170 in, uh, this year. Um, this is a picture of a panel that's located on one of those benchmarks that we talked about. We try to hide them as much as we can from view and um, right after the overflight, we run a trip to pick all this, this, uh, these panels up so they're not just um, deteriorating out there in the national park. Um, we spend a lot of effort to put these out and we also spend a lot of effort to uh, make sure we don't leave any of our trash down there. Um, here's a picture of uh, that eminence area that we were looking at earlier. And I wanted to show you a aerial photo um, of this benchmark right here. So there's the, the photo panel that shows up in the, the um, aerial photography. It's all digital aerial photography and it, it uses these panels to rectify the imagery. Both the elevation of that point is known and the position of that point is known. And it uses the, um, it takes all of that imagery that, that's overlapping and rectifies it into a map product called an ortho photograph. Um, another thing that we do, another product out of the aerial photography is that they, they do um, photogrammetry on the overlapping photographs and they pull out topography. So they, they make a, a coverage of the area that's collected in the photos and they, they, um, the product is called a digital surface model, and it has uh, one point every meter that has an elevation 
to it. We collect information along the corridor to ground truth the digital surface model produced by the photogrammetry um, so that we can check its accuracy on the ground. And um, I won't spend too much time on this, but we know very well how accurate those um, uh, the digital surface model is. Um, this this is 2019 and 2013, and they're all they're all good to about um, about 10 centimeters or so, give or take, depending on where you are. So here's a, um, a grayscale image of the digital surface model showing on the left here. This is 2009, and on the right, this is 2013, and how it captured. Um, it's not, this isn't a debris flow, it was actually a rock fall from up in this area, fell down and um, spilled out over the corridor there. So um, these digital surface models combined, combined with the photography are very powerful tools to assess the conditions down on the ground. Another thing that um, this photography could be used for, this is an example from uh, 2009 is looking at vegetated area along the corridor. And lighter grayscale here is the width of the channel at 8,000 cubic feet per second or 226 cubic meters per second. And the darker grays re represent uh, the amount of vegetation, the area of vegetation cover. And you can see that um, in the wider areas of the canyon, there's more vegetation because there's more um, surface area for those things. Another um, pretty cool study, I think, by Bedford and others. Uh, Bed, uh, oh, I'm blanking on the first name, but it, uh, Techie Senke, Joel Senke, Techies at NAU, Joel and Barb Ralston at USGS looked at um, beetle impacted tamarisk stands. So this is uh, the mouth of Kanab Creek, 145 miles, 144 miles downstream. And this area is zoomed in on 2009 and 2013. And in 2013, you can see this dark sort of dead looking trees here. Those are areas in yellow on the right, lower right here that have been impacted by beetles. And then again, this aerial photography allows us to take those assessments in a system-wide basis and look at things by um, Tamara's stand by percentage that's been impacted. And um, you, can, you can see how those patterns emerge and actually look and track where the beetle populations are moving. Um, so that's it for the aerial photography. I wanted to move now into the uh, channel mapping portion and how we um, use these topographic maps to monitor sand mass balance and storage um, and produce these morphologically based sand budgets. Um, this project, it's, it's a big project from a simple question, how much sand is needed in the channel to maintain sandbars along the banks? Sometimes simple questions are hard to answer. Um, the way we do this is we do, uh, we map the bed of the river and the banks of the river within these different monitoring reaches, uh, blue for upper marble, lower marble, Eastern Grand Canyon, East Central Grand Canyon. And we've repeated these mapping efforts in these different areas to look at the changes in sediment within the, the corridor. Um, to date, this map shows in bright green here, the areas that we have mapped um, in the canyon to date. Uh, this should be 2019, sorry. Um, this spring, we're going to fill in the map here uh, from Phantom Ranch down to National Canyon. And um, I, I have to mention that even in 2021, there's areas of the Grand Canyon that are not mapped. There's blanks in the map still. And that is something that um, um, it, it's, it's personally satisfying to, to, and it gives you this sense of discovery, a uh, sense of exploration when you're going down there and mapping um, that makes this job uh, just amazing. Um, the way 
we do these channel maps is we combine several different survey methods to produce um, on the left here uh, is a digital elevation model of the Lee's Ferry area. This is a digital, on the right is a digital elevation model of the eminence area that we were looking at earlier. Um, we combine in light blue on both of these are multi-beam sonar, yellow is single beam sonar. The big red dots are uh, total station surveys. And in this case, for the, from the 2013 imagery shown here, we use the digital surface model excuse me, shown in with these little red dots to produce the topographic maps in for the um, portion of the corridor from the dam down to Lee's Ferry. Um, total station surveys, it's an instrument you'll see around town, same instruments we apply to um, uh, surveying the topography along the canyon. We survey out into the water a little bit, probably about a meter deep and along the banks, occupying those ground, those total the uh, survey benchmarks to shoot in the topography. And those are shown in, in this area in, uh, in red. Um, about, we use this to do about 10% of the map area. We go out to about a half a meter or a meter and um, we survey in, in this case, they're surveying the edge of the water. They do have life jackets on, by the way. Um, for the Glen Canyon portion of the map, we use the digital surface model um, to produce, I just showed a chunk of the digital surface model here. Um, the, this is the air, aerial photography with our map inlaid into it around the big bend here. Um, this is that point up by page that um, everybody is take pictures of the corridor with. Um, and you can see the pretty good detail on the bed in there. Um, Matt, you've got about five minutes. Oh boy, I better go. Um, so <laughs> sonar surveys. Um, sonar stands for sound navigation and ranging. Um, it uses an echo sounder to bounce sound off of the bed of the river and uh, records it back at this uh, sonar. Thing. There's two types of sonar we use, multi-beam sonar that, um, that produces a swath of sounds and it records, uh, depending on the depth, I think it's four times the, the width of the um, swath is four times the depth and single beam sonar that produces depths just along uh, a, a single line. We use the single beam to get in um, close to shore where there's a lot of rocks um, we keep the multi-beam to about two meters of depth. Um, we map about 70% with the multi-beam. Um, we try to keep it to about two meters um, because we know at the edge of the river, that's where the rocks are. And these things are pretty expensive. Um, there's a single beam sonar boat, about 20% um, percent of the area is mapped with the single beam transducer. Um, all of the boats are tracked by um, these robotic total stations that lock onto a target because at the bottom of the Grand Canyon, GPS signals are unreliable. So we use this uh, robotic line of sight tracking and um, the, all of the electronics are housed in these aluminum boxes that we can shut everything down and run the rapids down there. Um, and then we open up the box when we're mapping. Um, the purpose of the, the surveys is to map the sediment. So this is an example of the eminence area. Again, um, one of the, um, the areas, and here's a map from 2009 to 2012. And what you do is simply subtract those two surveys and the difference between those two surveys shows you where um, sediment has been eroded in red or deposited in green or in yellows, there really is no change. And then that's scaled up to about 30 to 60 mile reaches, depending on um, where we go. Again, we've um, mapped everything, but um, the Phantom Ranch to National Canyon stretch. And um, one of the questions I get asked all the time is how deep is the river? Um, well, we've compiled, um, about eight and a half million um, grid cells 
And we can tell you that the re river is about, the median value is about 5.4 meters deep. It's about 25 feet. Um, I'm gonna speed up here because um, I'm running out of time. Um, one thing that we've learned is that small changes occur at most locations, but large changes occur at one. So here's, a, here's an eddy um, right below President Harding Rapid at 43 mile, 43.6 mile. Over 70% of the, the change in sediment has occurred in this one eddy in the river. So we're learning all, all kinds of stuff about how the river works. And I thought I'd end by just showing you some of this imagery because I think it's, it's pretty amazing. Um, here's a, a picture of what the bed of the river looks like in a color scale. Red is shallower, purple is deep blue or deeper right below the dam. Um, this is right below the, the, Nava, the two Navajo bridges. This um, area very shallow beneath the old bridge that was built in the 20s, I believe, is one of the only um, man-made um, hydraulic constrictions in the river. All of this debris here was from the um, construction of this bridge. The new one, they had nets under it. They, they didn't allow that. And some of this image, I just think it's uh, pretty amazing. This is a, a stretch right above uh, Badger Rapid, if you're familiar with that, um, showing all these uh, beautiful, this dune field on the bed of the river. Um, this is Saddle Canyon. You can see how the sediment, these dunes in the sediment in, within the eddy form and out in the main channel. Um, here are two surveys around 60 mile showing how the bed changes over, um, this is 2012 and this is 2013. You can see how in the same place, the, the bed of the river is moving all the time. The deepest place we've sounded so far is right above Phantom Ranch. Here's the, the corkscrew coming down to the, to the uh, Kaibab Bridge. Here's the boat beach. Right upstream offshore of this buttress, it was uh, our depths at 8,000 CFS is about uh, 26 meters. So it's 80 some feet deep there. And so far that's our deepest uh, place we've sounded in the channel mapping. Um, the resolution on, these th on this system is pretty amazing. I'd like to show this one because it has, it shows the um, features in the bedrock. Um, it shows the fractures in the bedrock ledges, the Bright Angel Shale ledges along uh, river left here and a lot of the beautiful um, bed forms of the bottom of the river in the sand. Um, this is um, this amazing circular bow wake around Vulcan's Anvil down there above Lava Falls. And um, I, maybe I should stop there. Yeah. Um, how much time do I have, Joe? We've got about nine minutes left for questions. Um, okay, I don't see much. Without going into the sediment classification, maybe we should stop there and see if there's any questions. Okay, sounds good. Before I open it up to Dave for questions, I'm gonna post a couple things in the chat for attendees to view. There are a couple of the links that I shared earlier. And as I'm posting those, I will let Dave take over with uh, any questions we've got. Uh, can you hear me, Matt? I sure can, Dave. Hi. Uh, I didn't get any questions on chat, but I have a question for you. Okay. Uh, can you tell us where the funding comes from for all of this work? Yeah, sure. Um, the Adaptive Management Program is funded through um, uh, the Bureau of Reclamation. And um, up until a few years ago, it was funded by power revenues from Glen Canyon Dam. Um, so it was, it was sort of a model for um, government efficiency. It, it, was a, 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 it was a program that kind of funded itself in a way. Um, we did use power revenues from the dam to fund, um, fund the program. The programs, um, it's an $11.1 million a year program. Eight and a half of that funding came from the Bureau. I think there's some appropriated money from 
the uh, USGS. Um, and in the last couple of years, it's switched over um, to appropriated money. So it, in the last couple of years, it's been a taxpayer funded um, thing. But the, the money, I'm not sure I'm an expert on the funding of this program and how it works, but the funding, the, the money, the power revenues from the dam are still going back to the government. Um, so um, that's who's paying for it. All of our funding at NAU comes through um, the USGS, um, through grants, and the USGS money comes from the Bureau of Reclamation. Great, thanks. Great answer. Uh, I know it's a complicated story when you have big projects. Yeah. I have one, uh, one other question. Have you recognized any tectonic events in your measurements of the benchmarks, uplift or translational movement? We have not, but an ongoing, the, the control network benchmark is an ongoing, um, every time we go down there and measure things, more measurements are better and um, we tie things in um, in, a, in a better way. Um, the, the National Geodetic Survey has just come out with a new, um, with new, oh, what would you call it? Um, new benchmark numbers where they have applied um, the new, the newer version applies uh, plate tectonic movement to the actual um, benchmark numbers. So those are being incorporated into the, um, to the geodetic control network. Um, as far as I know, there hasn't been um, any um, earthquake activity that would move any of the benchmarks within the corridor. Doggone it. <laughs> I know, it'd be pretty cool. <laughs> Thanks. It looks like we've had a couple other questions trickle in here. Great. Um, one of them comes from Rose. She asks, are those depths a surprise to you? Always thought deeper spots were in order of 200 feet or so, but not sure what source that was. Um, yeah, they are. It's uh, um, one of the, like I was saying earlier, one of the, the, the joys of this job is mapping these new places. And um, I'm, pretty surprised we haven't found anything over 100 feet deep um, but we do have we I'm guessing that there there may be a handful of, of places that are a bit deeper than um, above Phantom Ranch but um, based on mapping most of the canyon already I I don't think we've, we're getting anything over 100 feet deep okay but um, we're gonna go down there and find out yeah, you have to answer the question. That's right. We have another one from uh, Richard. How do you use all this information to manage the river and releases from the dam? Good question, Richard. Um, the, the process, I didn't go into um, the sediment budgeting process, but the main question for um, what the, the there's, a, it's called the LTEMP, it's the Long-Term Experimental Plan. Um, that includes these high flows, our assessments of the sediment budget um, are being used to answer whether or not that question, whether or not there's enough sediment in the channel, given these flow operations to support um, building these sandbars back up. Um, I believe in 2025, the LTEMP um, is going to be reassessed and all these resource goals will be um, evaluated. Um, this information will feed back to that adaptive management group. Um, and in conjunction, that the adaptive management group includes all of the federal agencies that are, um, that are involved down here. It includes all of the tribes that choose to participate, all of the um, environmental, uh, it has seats for environmental groups, um, recreation groups, power users, 
those the answers to those questions um, will be run. The, the assessment of the of these different resources will be run through um, that management group, and they will make, make recommendations to the Secretary of Interior on how to change dam operations for the betterment of the, the resources. It, it may turn out that it won't work. Um, I don't know, but our assessments right now, based on the high flow events, show that the, um, the amount of sediment um, is not declining over time, like not significantly and that the sandbars themselves are bigger than they were. There's more, there's more sediment, the volume of sediment on the sandbars that we monitor is higher or not lower uh, than it was in 1990. So um, preliminarily, um, it looks like this uh, high flow protocol is keeping the sandbars built. Um, given climate change, um, and reductions in the amount of uh, precipitation in the Southwest, who knows? Great. Um, okay, we're right up to the finish line here. Uh, I posted the links that we mentioned at the start. You can always find these on our website at scifest.org. I really want to thank Matt Kaplinski. What an awesome presentation. Thanks for all your information. And we sure hope to see you in future festival events. Yeah, happy to do it. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Matt. Nice job.